Hello, my name is Camilla Elliott. I teach in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. This workshop is about Ted Hughes' poem, Hawk Roosting, which was written in 1960. It combines instruction with activities that you can do independently or in discussion with others. You can watch just the beginning, which gives you a basic overview of the poem, or you can continue on with the video and dig in more deeply. The other day I was speaking to a GCSE examiner who explained to me that students do not get points if they simply list formal poetic devices or simply describe contexts like author biography. What's needed is to integrate these things into the analysis of what the poem means in order to earn marks. That's what we're going to aim for in this workshop. But the first thing we have to ask about any poem is, what is the poem about? Once we have a basic understanding of the poem, then we can add these cultural contexts and these poetic features to enrich our analysis and to create stronger essays. Let's begin by reading the poem. I sit in the top of the wood, my eyes closed, in action. No falsifying dream between my hooked head and hooked feet, or in sleep rehearse perfect kills and eat. The convenience of the high trees, the air's buoyancy and the sun's ray are of advantage to me, and the earth's face upward for my inspection. My feet are locked upon the rough bark, it took the whole of creation to produce my foot, my each feather. Now I hold creation in my foot, or fly up and revolve it all slowly. I kill where I please, because it is all mine. There is no sophistry in my body. My manners are tearing off heads, the allotment of death. For the one path of my flight is direct through the bones of the living. No arguments assert my right. The sun is behind me. Nothing has changed since I began. My eye has permitted no change. I'm going to keep things like this. So, at first reading, the poem is about a hawk settling down for the night, describing its thoughts, how it sees its surroundings, its body, its beginnings, its daily activities, its hunting, and its relationship to its prey and to everything else. The hawk is perfectly satisfied with all of these. It wants to keep things like this. Some critics have said that this poem is Ted Hughes's attempt to imagine the mind of a hawk, a predator at the top of the food chain, who kills to survive out of sheer instinct rather than emotion or strategy. But other critics have argued, and I agree with them, that the poem uses the hawk as a metaphor to explore psychological states like narcissism and sociopathic violence, as well as totalitarian, despotic, predatory forms of authority and government. The fact that Hughes naturalizes these mental states and social systems through the figure of the hawk, who must, after all, hunt, kill and eat to survive, and does so, we assume, without anger or remorse, or even awareness of the suffering it inflicts, and certainly without arrogance, has troubled some critics, as has the fact that Hughes uses religious language to describe the hawk state of mind, carrying the troubled ethics that the poem brings into human realms, into theologies of God. There is something actually quite comical about a hawk expressing such a Darwinian view of nature and yet insisting that everything's going to stay the same forever and ever, amen. According to Darwin, everything evolves. Nothing stays the same. Let's just look at it verse by verse 
in light of these ideas that on the one hand it's just about an animal and the other that it's actually about more than just an animal. So the first verse, I would agree, is just the animal, uh, thinking only about hunting and animal things as he falls asleep. But from the second verse on, we start to see him thinking in human ways uh, of himself as the center of the universe, where everything exists purely for his benefit, to serve him and for his exploitation. We have him then moving beyond the human to being a godlike figure who looks down on the earth and inspects it, and who, while acknowledging himself as an act of creation, sees himself as the pinnacle of that creation, as we humans do in certain creation stories, but more than that, now of holding the whole of creation in his foot at the top of creation and perhaps as a godlike figure. One of the things that's disturbing is that he condenses the whole of creation into something so small that he can hold it in his foot and collapses it into that tiny personal pronoun, it, even as he celebrates his each feather, each separate feather and different parts of his own body. He reduces everything else to one single impersonal pronoun. And he goes beyond in the fourth stanza, the fact that a hawk needs to kill to eat and to survive, to expressing his right to kill almost as a divine right because he owns all of creation. I kill where I please because it is all mine. And yet as he does, he reasserts his animal nature and the instinctive basis for his killing. Unlike human rulers who kill to maintain power, to build wealth, or to express their anger and enact revenge, he doesn't feel a need to lie about or even explain his destructive actions. There is no sophistry in my body. No arguments assert my right. This is just the way he is, naturally, bringing the allotment of death direct through the bones of the living. Now, this may be all that you want or need for your studies, but if you want to achieve high marks on your GCSE or other exams or assessments, you will need to work contextual information into your thinking, into your interpretation of the poem, and into your writing. So in the next section of this workshop, I'm going to discuss briefly a few possible contexts for you to use when you analyze the poem. Author biography, the tradition of poets and birds, poets and nature, the relationship between nature and politics, and World War II and the Cold War. So let's start with author biography. This is a photograph of Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes was born into a lower middle class Yorkshire family, and he often went hunting and fishing with his older brother. Although this is not a photo of him, it's one taken from the period when he was a child. Going out hunting in nature and watching animals hunt each other gave him a view of nature as an astonishingly beautiful, but also a savage realm where animals destroy other animals and humans destroy animals as well. Both before and after Hughes, poets have associated themselves with birds and their poetry with birds and birdsong. Looking over other poets on the list of GCSE texts across various exam boards, in the Romantic period, we have John Keats with The Nightingale, Percy buys Shelley and the Skylark, Wordsworth and these birds plus others, including the cuckoo. In the Victorian period, there is Alfred Lord Tennyson writing about the owl and the swallow, Thomas Hardy ruminating depressingly on the darkling thrush, Gerald Manley Hopkins celebrating the wind hover, and Emily Dickinson associating herself with the humble robin. 
All of these birds represent different aspects of the poet and poetry. I don't have time here to go into them, but there's lots of interesting information about it. More recently, Owen Shears, who's also on the syllabus, has written about winter swans. Poets at Lancaster University have written about birds, Paul Farley about the demise of the house sparrow, and Owen Walls has a 2020 poetry collection entitled Pigeon Songs. Hugh's chosen bird here is the hawk. This is a bird of prey who could and would tear through the bones of most of the birds favoured by other poets. Hughes is keenly interested in nature's power relationship and with animals who are at the top of the food chain. This is a point where you can pause the video and reflect and write a bit if you would like to. I would like to know if you were to choose a bird to describe your own poetry that you write or your favorite poetry if you don't write yourself, what would that bird be? Now we're going to think about nature and politics. Hughes is very interested in power in society as well as in nature. And for centuries, nature has been used to talk about political power as a metaphor for society. In 2020, we've seen the literal actual power of nature to intervene directly in politics and economics. A bat in China, most scientists believe, has wrought global havoc, killed thousands of people, and decimated economies around the world by transmitting a virus to the humans who captured it, to which we have no immunity. Many are equally concerned about the devastating effects of man-made activity on nature through climate change. But Ted Hughes and this poem are more concerned about the political animal, the human, who tells stories about nature to explore and to justify his own political nature and power. Now, Ted Hughes has made an interesting comment on his poem, Hawk Roosting. First of all, he claims that the bird is not a fascist, the symbol of some horrible genocidal dictator, and that what he had in mind was that in this hawk, nature was thinking, simply nature. But then he acknowledges it's not so simple because nature is no longer simple. And he says and admits that he intended some creator like the Jehovah in Job who does whatever he wants and causes great suffering for his subjects simply to test him. He also adds an interesting comment that the hawk sounds like Hitler's familiar spirit. Humans tell stories that use nature to dominate others. Nature is always filtered through religion, mythology and politics. It is impossible to simply get inside the head of an animal and express it directly. The hawk is reminiscent of the Nazi eagle and the hawk's assertion that he needs no arguments to assert his right to destroy other animals is reminiscent of the Nazi claim that their right to destroy the Jewish people and other races was predicated on the basis that the Aryan race was naturally superior to other races. Now is another place for you to stop and think and these aren't just idle exercises for you to do. I think uh, whenever I stop and think about how a poem relates to my life, to my society, it's actually much easier to remember it, it's much easier to get interested in it and to write about it. So I would like you to take some time pausing the video to consider uh, whether and where you might have seen nature used as a justification by one group to dominate another. 
Have you been told, for example, that certain things you do are not natural or not normal for boys or girls or people from your class or your background? Do you agree with these claims about what is natural? How has nature been used to keep you down or other people down? So this is a time for you to pause and ponder and if you're with other people to discuss. Following World War II, there was the Cold War. And this is a 40 year conflict between the US, capitalism and Russia, communism and their allies. It's called cold because the war was based on building up technologies and nuclear weapons that could destroy the world many times over rather than engaging in direct combat, or combat, although of course there were skirmishes and smaller wars. Technological warfare continues in 2020. You can look at the tech war between the US and China over 5G technology and how it is seen as a way to get global domination or to possibly stop somebody else from having global domination. Air power was central to the Cold War and to its technologies as this Soviet poster, poster makes clear. Glory to the Soviet people, creators of a mighty air force. So there we can see a, a kind of bird, a kind of air power uh, that is violent, deadly and lethal. Today we actually have helicopters named after hawks, Black Hawk helicopters. And their makers, Lockheed Barton, describe them as long range, survivable and lethal. One of the things you might want to think about is the ways in which air power and birds interact between Hughes's poem, if that is an interest of yours, and military air power. One of the things that's really important to do is to think about what a poem means to you personally. After we've thought about these cultural contexts and perhaps some parallels in our own day and age, I'd like you to think about how you see these power dynamics playing out in nature or in society. Perhaps you have a sweet, adorable cat who brings home dead mice and birds that your cat has tortured to death. Or perhaps you watch nature programs where animals kill other animals. Who do you identify with in those programs? Are you the hungry cougar or are you the prey? And then where do you see these power dynamics in society? Think about ways in which rulers, government might be trying to rip the thinking heads off the people that they govern. Or perhaps you think the media does this. We can also examine ourselves and we can think about how we deny differences and clump people into single objectified categories like the hawk placing the whole of creation into the tiny little word it and claiming that it is all an extension of him or there for him. And the ways in which these kinds of thinking project our own points of views and our needs and our rights onto other people at the expense of theirs. So take a little while to think about this. If you have someone with you, discuss it and then continue on. One of the things we do at Lancaster University is often we combine creative writing with literary criticism because even if we're not skilled, able creative writers, though we have many people who are, it really helps us to understand poetry more by actually trying to write uh, poetry or at least write creatively around a poem. So if you were really trying to just get inside of the head of a hawk to describe what it is that hawk thinks and feels uh, in his or her daily life, how would you write that down? Or perhaps you actually want to use the hawk as a metaphor for something that troubles you or that you're quite excited and enthusiastic about in society. How would you write the hawk the same or differently from Ted Hughes's writing of the hawk? 
So pause the video and take a little bit of time to do that. And then when you're ready, continue. Ted Hughes has been interviewed a number of times about the hawk and his poem, The Hawk. And is he just writing about animals or is he writing about humans? So there is another thing I'd like you to think about is how far we're like animals and different from animals. I mean, this has produced reams of thinking and writing for centuries and centuries. So everyone has their own opinion about this. And to consider as well whether you think that this poem is justifying human violence through animal violence and trying to excuse it and whether there are differences that mean that humans should be or ought to be less violent. You may think, no, we're actually more violent and we should be. One of the things that Ted Hughes talked about was this difference between animals and humans. In another interview, he challenged his critics to think about the meat industry, where the killing and destruction of animals for our consumption is hidden. In the poem, by contrast, the hawk doesn't try to hide anything or lie about it, no sophistry, and he doesn't try to make excuses or arguments for it. So in this way, perhaps you can think about this hawk as being somewhat purer than humans or more direct or more honest than humans. Okay, if you'd like to take a break, take a break now. But what we're going to do in the next section of this video is to look at how the poem's form informs the meaning. This is something that any good essay needs to do as well. Words are building blocks for poems. They're not just transparent windows that you're trying to look through and past to get to some kind of meaning on the other side. They create structures of meaning just like bricks, windows and walls create houses. They have particular functions and do particular things. So in your analysis of any poem, you want to pay attention to different kinds of words. Sometimes it helps to understand a poem far better and more deeply by tracing one kind of word across the whole poem. So in this last part of this video, I'm going to ask you to trace some words and see how they enrich and deepen your analysis. First, we're going to look at personal pronouns. Then we're going to look at nouns and finally verbs. This is a poem where I'm not prioritizing alliteration, assonance, rhyme and meter because in this poem, this fairly primal poem, these parts of speech to me give more information that can build a really strong essay. Let's start now with the personal pronouns. These are I, me, mine, my, you, yours, we, ours, she, hers, he, his, it, its, they, theirs. Those are personal pronouns. What I'd like you to do is pause the video and underline, circle, highlight, make a list of all of the personal pronouns that you can find in this poem. When you're ready, let's continue on. I've highlighted the personal pronouns that I have found in this poem. And analyzing them as a separate category of words, just like you might analyze the windows in a building, really strengthens reading uh, instead of just going line by line. What the personal pronouns here do is they emphasize the narcissism of the hawk and its disregard for other things and other lives. On the previous slide, you saw them. there are so many different kinds of personal pronouns available to write and express yourself in relation to others. But in this poem, I, my, and mine, highlighted in red, dominate, appearing 21 times. The only other personal pronoun is it, stands a four, it appears twice. And as we've seen, it is used to encompass the whole of everything 
that is not the hawk. And it is a highly impersonal pronoun that mirrors the hawk's inability to see other things, other entities, as having any kind of identity or subjectivity, no gender, whether they're not plural, they're all singular. And so this would be something to write into your essay that would make for a really strong statement about the form of the poem. Now, this may be all you'd like to do. You may just be looking for one thing to put into your essay. But for those of you who'd like to see what more you can do by tracing words, we're going to go on now and have a look at another part of speech. In this slide, I want you to trace the nouns. It will drive home what's going on with the personal pronouns even more powerfully. So pause the video, underline, list, highlight, whatever system you'd like to use, all of the nouns in the poems. These are words that name things, feelings, states, entities, and so on. And again, when you're ready, continue with the video. You'll see that more than half of the 43 nouns that I've highlighted here in green refer to the hawk. And these continue the process that goes on with the pronouns. But it is important to look at the nouns describing other things if we're going to get a complete picture of this poem. Other things are discussed only in terms of what he does to them. They are perfect kills rather than other beings, other birds, other mammals, or in terms of what they do for him. The air's buoyancy and the sun's ray are of advantage to me. The hawk is not only at the top of the wood, but also at the centre of the universe, where everything is there for him, in service to him. The high trees are convenient for his hunting, gives him a good view of where he's going to hunt next. The air is only there to buoy him up as he flies, not to let others breathe. The sun is simply there to show him where his prey is. The whole of creation, by contrast, is condensed into an object that he can hold in one foot, authorizing him to kill without explanation because it all belongs to him. It's very bizarre spatially that he can fit the whole of creation into his tiny little claws. Uh, and yet that is expressing exactly how he feels about other things. By contrast, he celebrates his individual body parts, his feet, his foot, his each and every feather, and his eye in the last stanza. The other nouns on the second side of the slide have a lot to do with describing his destruction of his prey and of other lives and his refusal to explain, to make any excuses or to justify what he does. Finally, I want you to look at how verbs describe the hawk's relationship to other things. Verbs are words describing actions, states and occurrences, doing, being, feeling, happening. And in a poem about power, the verbs are very telling about who has the power and the agency, who does things and who things are done to. So as you've done with the previous slides, go ahead and pause the video list the verbs, look at them in relation to each other, think about them and how they express the hawk's relationship to others, and then when you're ready, continue. Okay, so in general, verbs convey two main things in this poem. First of all, as I've said, they indicate power and agency, actions done by, done to things. You can have active verbs, you can have passive verbs. So take a look at what the hawk does. He sits, he rehearses, he eats, his feet are locked, he holds, he flies up, he revolves, he kills, he tears, 
he forbids change, and he maintains the status quo. But what's even more striking to me is the way in which he takes verbs away from other things so that we almost have ungrammatical, incomplete sentences when he's writing about other things. Stanza two, the convenience of the high trees, right? There's no verb there. And, and the last line of that stanza, the earth's face upward for my inspection. It isn't turned upward, there's no agency, it's just there, it's just upward. And what you can say about verbs here is the hawk tears verbs away from other nouns, other be other entities, in the same way that he tears the thinking heads off of his prey. If you think about killing, that is the ultimate removal of agency and the ability to act and to do and to be with verbs. The second thing that verbs indicate is the passage of time. The hawk is focused only on the present. In the first verse, the present moment of falling asleep, but also a kind of continuous ongoing present of his life, which he hopes in the last stanza will be eternal and forever. He's at the top of the food chain, so any change that verbs bring is going to threaten his position. The hawk, we could say, is a deist who does not believe in evolution, even as he is an example of evolution. We could say he is delusional. He hasn't thought about the possibility of even his own death, his declining power as he ages, let alone the possibility of another creature becoming stronger than he and being positioned at the top of the food chain. I hope that this video has been helpful to you. Here is a list of some further reading if you are interested. Here is where I found the images used in this workshop. The ones that are not listed here come from PowerPoint templates that I have used. Thank you for watching, listening and participating in this workshop. If you're interested in learning more about what it's like to study English literature or creative writing or both at university, you can start with our website. Feel free to contact us with any questions. I wish you well in your studies.